We're here tonight at a very pivotal time, I think, in the climate crisis. The Glasgow Climate Summit, as many of you will know, is set for November this year. And it's been called by many our last best hope to get the world on track to avoid dangerous climate change. And what Australia does this year really matters. As you know, we're the world's uh, biggest coal exporter and we vie for the title as the world's largest LNG exporter. How ambitious we are in the shift to clean energy really matters. And we are now finally coming under a lot of pressure from our friends and allies. Our trading partners have made pledges to reach the goal of net zero by 2050, but the Morrison government still can't say those words. It's a real privilege tonight to be able to talk to three people who all have big ideas on what lies ahead for us, especially this year. Tim, I was very interested in this book of yours. It's a tough book and it's an angry book. And it really ratchets up the issue of the urgency of the climate crisis. It has become much, much worse in the last decade. So, you know, I was uh, Australian of the Year in 2007. Since then, the world has emitted between a quarter and a third of all the greenhouse gas emissions that we've ever emitted in that period. So this is how rapidly the problem is growing. Every year brings more emissions. And we're, we are now emitting at a volume which is it's planet changing every year. So we need to cut really, really hard and fast with this. And it's a bit like COVID. Do you remember back in March last year when the Prime Minister, you know, there was a bit of back and forth. People didn't understand how serious the problem was. But we were at a point by about March 13 where leave it another week and you've got 2,000 or 4,000 cases. Leave it another week after that, you've got 10,000 or 20,000, and then it's run away. Well, that's about where we're at with the climate problem now, because the Earth system has its own internal momentum, and we have poured a massive amount of heat into the oceans, into the Earth's crust, into the atmosphere, that, that will carry that momentum forward. And a point is eventually reached where the, the whole Earth system changes and, and flips into a new state. We're not there yet, but we are close to that point. I feel, and a lot of people feel, no urgency from the Prime Minister and the government, and for that matter, no real urgency from the leader of the opposition and the Labor Party. So what happens now? And also, you're there, you're in Canberra, why don't they feel this urgency? If you think back to the 2007 election, you actually had both major parties went to the election agreeing to climate change being a major risk and needing policy. Um, at the time, you had uh, Kevin Rudd and you had John Howard, and both had come to a view, maybe Howard was reluctantly, but he had come to a view that he needed to address it. Um, unfortunately, what we then saw is the politics took over rather than common sense and good policy. Um, and in contrast, Trust, the UK, they had a Friends of the Earth campaign that started in 2005. They had a private member's bill introduce a climate change bill to their parliament. It was subsequently passed in 2008 with bipartisan support. And that legislation locked in a framework. So it locked in the long-term goal and an accountability mechanism of how they were going to get there. It didn't get into, it didn't delve down into the weeds of the how and what the prescriptive mechanism was going to be. It set out the framework, you know, that we're going to have a budget, that every five years you're going to review the budget and set the next budget. You're going to have a climate change committee that gave it um, independent, expert-based advice. Um, and what was incredibly, uh, I think, efficient about that system is that it survived 10 years of Brexit. It survived 10 years of really divisive politics in the UK because how they saw it was that this climate change committee could take the heat 
they could take the blame if the, tech, the technology they backed was the wrong technology or if there was anything wrong. The politicians actually had an insurance policy because the Climate Change Committee was the one advising on, on the how to do it. Um, and as a result, they've been really efficient in reducing their emissions. They're at about 68% by 2030. So the Climate Change Bill that I introduced in November last year is very much modelled on that system. I think a lot of people are looking for the common sense. They're looking for the, the, the roadmap, the pathway out of the problem. There are a lot of people recognise how dire the problem is, but that can be really paralysing. And people need actually the solutions of how can we do it? What's, what's, what's the recipe or the, the roadmap to get out of there? The, the biggest thing that business hates is risk. It drives up the cost of capital, the debt for your thing, whatever you're building, buying, whatever. And fundamentally, we've had 20 or 30 years of uncertain flip-flop changes in policy. We had a carbon price. We didn't have a carbon price. Even if you look recently with all the gas, sorry, I was going to swear again, I get in trouble. My parents are in the audience. Um, all of the gas malarkey we've had recently just creates an environment of uncertainty, right? And that, that's the biggest problem, to be honest, from the federal government. If they set some sensible policy rules and then got out of town, I think we'd have a far better chance of actually solving it. We shouldn't forget we have an opportunity, right? What I always get frustrated by in Australia is people write about this stuff like it's a cost we have to pay, it's a tax, it's a downside for our country, right? This, is, this transition is going to happen. How painful and quick that happening is, is entirely up to us. 15 years from now, we need total militarization of almost entire economies to move all factories to producing things to change this. We will, as humans, need to solve this problem. How long we wait is how painful it is. In that transition, Australia has just the most immense opportunity, right? It's the single largest economic opportunity facing our country. And we don't get that. We never phrase it in that manner, right? And if we did, we'd say, well, how are we going to seize that opportunity? What are we going to do, right? And then we'd start rolling downhill instead of constantly feeling like we're herding sheep uphill. Sun Cable is a business that's in the business of building cables. Our first cable will be from Northern Territory to Singapore. Uh, it'll supply about 25% of Singapore's energy needs on a daily basis from uh, about 125 square kilometres of uh, desert slash, you know, uh, uh, farmland in uh, Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory. Uh, along the way, it requires us to build the world's largest solar farm, uh, which is fairly large. It's about 12% uh, of Australia's entire energy generation is what we're currently building in the Northern Territory connected to the world's largest battery uh, and then connected to the world's largest subsea cable, which all makes it sound crazy, but it's absolutely not crazy. Like I keep telling people, this is an entirely logical project, right? Australia can export, we could have 50 cables. We have 3 billion consumers to the north. We have more sun than we know what to do with. We have more wind than we know what to do with. None of the pieces of what we're building are at all new. And we're just putting them all together into a singular energy system, which is incredibly complicated and hard and very expensive. Um, the first cable is about $25 billion, uh, but it's, it will be seen to be, I think, very simple. I think we'll have many, many more of them afterwards, and we should entirely be exporting. We can export Northern Territory sunshine to Singapore cheaper than they can generate energy themselves. And we could do that to Indonesia, to Papua New Guinea, to New Zealand, to lots of other places um, as one method of exporting our energy, which we are very lucky and again Australian capital, Australian talent and Australian sunshine and wind. When we talk about carbon neutral by 2050 we're talking about driving the fossil fuel industry to extinction in the next 30 years. It's not a nice process, there'll be social consequences and, and whatever but we as a society need to understand that because we'll have to pay for and deal with those consequences. We don't want to leave anyone behind in this transition. If we do that we will, we will lose. Yeah? So we have to go in with a very clear vision of what we're trying to do and understand fully the consequences of that as a society. Because if we don't do that, I think we just won't, we won't get there in time. It's an interesting factoid that you may not all be aware of. At COP25 in Madrid last year, uh, well, the year before last now, Australia participated in completely blowing up those talks. Right? As an Australian, I was ashamed. It was absolutely shameful what we did. We literally held the world to ransom and blew it up. We did it, I'm using slightly extreme language, but that's literally what we did. We did it with two other countries, Saudi Arabia and Russia and Australia. Three countries conspired. Now, not normally countries we have a lot in common with, 
not normally countries who spend a lot of politically not super aligned, you would argue, uh, ideologically, religiously, lots of differences between those three countries. What do we have in common? We are the three largest exporters of fossil fuels in the world. One of the best options we've got for drawing down CO2 is, is seaweed production because seaweed grows so fast. But how big a seaweed farm would you need to draw down just one gigaton? Does anyone have an idea? You'd need a seaweed farm the size of South Australia to do one gigaton. And we're putting up 50 a year. So when we talk about preparedness to, to act, the emissions reduction is absolutely essential, but we have to understand that there is a, a whole lot of other consequences that will play out over decades, which where we need, we really need capacity to act. I guess my belief is they're trying to shift away from coal without looking like they're moving away from coal to keep their base happy. So they need to stick with the fossil fuel, so they'll stick with gas. I think it's political game playing. It's not about the practicalities or the realities of the market. At the same time, uh, I think there is that lobbying of the fossil fuel industry. There is the influence that comes to bear. It's they're looking at what seats they're trying to win at the next election how do they hold on to government. Um, it, it doesn't make sense because it's an intervention into a market from a coalition government that really should be, you know, firmly believing in the free market and that really market forces should be taking over. The gas-led recovery is a term that is covering many concepts in one term. And we need to understand and separate these concepts, right, very, very clearly. Firstly, we need to understand that gas is not clean. It's very, very bad for the environment. It's even worse, it, I'll leave Tim to do the technical explanations, but the methane that comes from burning that is way worse for the environment, certainly in the short term, global warming. It is a very, very bad thing, so let's not pretend just because it's clear and we can't see it and it looks nice. Secondly, when we talk about the gas-led recovery, we need to separate three different concepts. The first is we have um, about 10% of the NEM, roughly, of the energy market we currently have, east of Australia, is using gas-fired power generation as a balancing force as renewables come on in larger and larger quantities. We don't, we should not shut any of these down early, nor will they shut down early because they're economic and they're running. So that's fine. Talk to the chief scientist, he'll tell you we should keep running the existing gas plants we have. Tick. Everyone largely agrees. They're already paid for, they're running, they're good. The second thing you get to is do we need new gas fired power stations? So do we need new gas power stations to replace these coal power stations? That's what the government is trying to intervene in that particular market to do. The answer is no. AMO, the energy market operator, will say we don't need them. There's a reason that no one in private enterprise is building them because that's a stranded asset. That will not be profitable over the 30 years you need to build one. So no one in private industry is going to build a gas-fired power station. It is an unprofitable project. You will lose money to do so. Do we need it? No, we don't. We have enough gas-fired power ready in the NEM to support three, four times the number of renewables we have. It'll take us 10 years to get there or more. So we don't need it. There is no necessity. There is no plan IEMO has. In fact, the integrated systems plan, which is really important to understand. It's a technical sounding term. This is our market operator who said, here is plans for the future of the world and our energy system, how we think it's going to evolve, the electricity system. Their least cost plans, none of them involve any more gas. So the plans that will put the cheapest energy in your pocket, none of them involve any new gas-fired power. New plants. So we don't need any new plants. Where the government's being really swift here is Beetaloo, basins, pipelines. This is about gas extraction. This is about pulling more gas out of the ground and shipping it overseas. This has no bearing on your wallet, on the price of your electricity, this has no bearing on anything to do with what they say is a gas-fired recovery. The immediate political response is to sell you fear, is to try and get that community to fear the future, fear what was being announced and what could happen, instead of actually getting down to the task of putting in place a plan. And that's the thing we really have to call time on, I think, is the fear politics, fearing the change, fearing what needs to be done. Angus Taylor's EV program that was rolled out a few weeks ago. How disappointing was that? It had nothing to really encourage our transition to electric vehicles. We don't have a domestic car manufacturing industry. We don't need to protect anything. We are actually at the mercy of what the rest of the world does and the, West of, the rest of the world is transitioning. It is going to EVs and actually we are at real risk that our, um, our uh, fuel standards are incredibly bad. Um, and our emission standards of our cars are incredibly bad. And as a result, the 
overseas manufacturers ultimately can't send their best model cars to Australia. We can't get the latest features, the latest safety features, um, because our standards simply aren't compatible with what they're making for the rest of the world. What happens is most of the vehicle manufacturers have fully paid off factories that are generating a certain model, right? And we are the only market for that model, but that factory's already paid off, so they'll keep generating that model and sending it to us. If we raise our standards, they'll have no market for that model, they'll shut that factory and have to invest in a new one to move over, right? So we do actually, it would make a difference if we raised our vehicle standards in terms of the, the quality of vehicles we get sent. It actually would make a, a significant difference, let alone making the EVs go downhill. It's nearly like a denialism that there is opportunity there. Tim? Look, I, strangely enough, the thing that gives me uh, optimism is the government's response to the COVID pandemic, where you know we saw the science followed, early action was taken, was financially, economically expensive, but we knew we had to do it. If our vested interest in a nation is in making this happen, we will be a world leader, right? And I do believe we can be a renewable energy superpower, right? As, as, as many people have written, that's a totally possible path for us. Great economic prosperity for all of us and the world and Australia and everything else and solving the problem at the same time, right? And so we should have more opportunity, more optimism than any country on earth, right? In a carbon constrained world, Australia is a winner. So we should be putting up all the things we can to move in that direction. And we have the, the smarts and the capital and everything to get it done. So we'll just have to get it done. Bucatino is Avalon's premier bookstore at 66 Old Barangoy Road, Avalon, Sydney. Find us online at bucatino.com.au.